A reasonable assumption of the strain that composite beams undergo is its linearity along the direction the beam is being bent. If we look at a composite bar made out of material 1 and material 2, top and bottom, where the elastic modulus of 1 is lower than that of 2, we'd see that the strain starts at 0 for y equal to 0, that is, on the neutral axis, and it increases linearly until it reaches a maximum value either at the top or the bottom. There is no discontinuity of the strain at the boundary between material 1 or 2. If there was a discontinuity and the value of strain was different between 1 micron into material 2 and 1 micron into material 1, we would effectively have the surface at the boundary slipping with respect to each other and therefore we'd have the material literally breaking apart at the boundary. By multiplying the strain by the elastic modulus of each material, we see that there is indeed a discontinuity of the stress at the boundary, which is totally fine. Because the elastic modulus of material 2 is higher than that of material 1, material 2 can take a higher stress coming from the bending moment and still result in a comparable strain to material 1, so it is expected to see a discontinuity between materials at the boundary for values of stress. This discontinuity could just as well occur if the cross section of the bar was not rectangular, but somewhat T-shaped and then transformed into a rectangular shape. The strain would again not show any discontinuity, as again, we don't expect the material to crack and slip at the y value for which the width of the cross section changes, but the stress that we would calculate from my over i with the larger area would be higher if we suddenly reduce the value of i to make it a rectangular bar. There are many reasons why the transformed section affects its base and not its height, or more accurately said for general purposes, why the transformation affects the dimension that is perpendicular to the axis of the bending. I'll mention three of them here, and each one of them is enough on its own to justify this statement. If we were transforming the height h to compensate for the different elastic modulus, we would be effectively modifying the location of the neutral axis, which throws off all remaining calculations, as all of them rely on the neutral axis location. More importantly, if the neutral axis is moved because of our modifications to the model, it would no longer be representative of what is happening in the real world, where the neutral axis does not move. With a transformed height, we would find either a higher value for the maximum strain, as we now go higher or lower to reach the top or bottom surface of the bar, or we would have to change the slope to get to the previously max strain value, which would either mess up the maximum strain at the other end, in this case at the top, or just completely change the neutral axis once again to maintain both original values. And again, neither of these would be representative of the actual strain that goes into the materials. One more reason, sufficient on its own as well, but more mathematical and therefore serving as more of a proof, is that the infinitesimal force df that we studied during the last video is obtained by multiplying the stress times the area dA. The stress is the elastic modulus times the strain, and the strain was derived to be minus y over rho. Since changing the height causes the neutral axis to move, the value of y would either increase or decrease, changing the value of the infinitesimal force df, which again is not at all accurate. From this expression, we easily see that the elastic modulus of one material can be written as n times the elastic modulus of the other material, where n is just the ratio between elastic moduli. Moving the n ratio next to dA, we see that what our transformed section is really doing is making our infinitesimal area slightly wider. And this is why we use transformed sections by making the whole material we try to replace wider or skinnier, not taller. So let's say we have two steel plates that have been welded together to form a beam in the shape of a T, and two oak timbers have been bonded, one on each side of the beam. The beam is a cantilever beam that is subjected to a distributed load and a point load. We want to find the maximum stresses inside the steel and the wood, and we would like to know the angle at the free end of the cantilever, C. To calculate the stresses, we'll need to find the maximum bending moment m, which we can find by using a bending moment diagram, and we need y and i, the distance to the top or bottom of the beam from the neutral axis, and the second moment of area, which also depends on the neutral axis. To calculate the angle at the free end, we need to find the moment as a function of x, so that by integrating, we can evaluate the angle function at x equals to 4 meters. Since that expression also relies on the second moment of area i, and to do that we need the neutral axis, we'll start with the neutral axis first. To find the neutral axis or the centroid of this cross-section area, we need to find the transformed section made of only one of the two materials. So in this case I'm going to transform the steel into wood. Because of the given elastic moduli, I know that the new dimensions of the steel, that is now wood, would be 16 times wider. 
Notice that the dimensions of the wood have not changed. To find the neutral axis of a beam that has a constant cross-section area, all we need to do is find the centroid, and this can be done by using any plane of reference. So to make the math easier, my point of reference will be the centroid of the bottom rectangle. The neutral axis or centroid would be equal to the weighted average of the distances from my point of reference to the centroid of each figure. The distance from my point of reference to the centroid of the red rectangle would be 75 plus 5, and the distance from my point of reference to the centroid of the green rectangle in the y direction would be 0. This tells me that the neutral axis is located at a positive distance of 25 millimeters from my point of reference. The total second moment of area can be easily calculated using the parallel axis theorem. If the distances d1 and d2 are those from the neutral axis to the centroid of the rectangles, it means that I need to use the expression for the second moment of area of a rectangle about its centroid, not the top or bottom of the rectangle, and that's why I'm using 1 over 12 instead of 1 over 3. The distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of the red rectangle would be 50 plus 5, and the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of the green rectangle would be 25. This gives us a second moment of area of 1.367 times 10 to the minus 4 meters to the fourth. The distance from the neutral axis to the top or the bottom of the beam is also of interest because those are the values my y variable will take when trying to calculate the stresses. So now that we have the second moment of area and the two possible values for y, we need to find the maximum moment. The maximum moment along the x-axis can be found if I have the bending moment diagram. For this, I need the shear diagram, and for it, I need to find the reactions at A, which can be easily found with a free body diagram. I will assume positive reactions for both the force and the moment. A sum of moments shows me that MA is equal to 5 kilonewtons meter, and the sum of forces in the y direction reveals that the reaction force A is negative 1 kilonewtons. The shear diagram for x equal to 0 will find the reaction at A, and from x equal to 0 to 2, I'll have a slope of 1.5, which brings me up 3 units to a value of 2. From x equal to 2 to 4, there are no external forces, so the value for V remains the same. And at x equals to 4, I find an external force of minus 2 kN. The only external moment is MA, so the initial value for the bending moment diagram is minus 5 with a slope of minus 1. Somewhere between x equal to 0 and 2, the slope would be 0, and from 2 to 4, it'll have a constant positive slope of 2. The maximum moment will therefore exist for x equal to 2 thirds, which is the x distance of the smaller triangle in those two similar triangles. The maximum moment can be found by adding the area under the curve from 0 to 2 thirds. With this information, I can calculate my stresses, since I have m, y, and i. However, let's look at the deflection before calculating the values for the stresses. Using singularity functions, I see that the distributed load function has a distributed load of 1.5 that starts at 0 and ends at 2. Integrating this function, I find the equation for shear, and the integration constants are just the external loads, Ra and 2, which are located at 0 and 4 respectively. Since the last term is always 0, even for when x is equal to 4, I don't need to take it into account. The reaction force is minus 1, and the x minus 0 terms can be just written as x. Integrating once again, I find the equation for the bending moment, and the integration constants are once again the external moment, which for ma I found that it's 5 kN. Because of the conventions we use, a positive ma of 5 is written here as minus 5, and once again I can get rid of the 0 inside the brackets. From what we learned during the last video, I know that the slope is equal to the integral of the moment divided by EI. This integral will have a constant, C1, and I would get a second constant, C2, when integrating once more to find the displacement as a function of x. The boundary conditions I use in this case is that since the beam is attached to the wall at x equal to 0, both the deflection and the slope should be 0. By substituting x equal to 0 in the theta and delta equations, I would find that both c1 and c2 are 0. So if I want to calculate the slope at the free end, which is theta for x equal to 4, I would use the elastic modulus of the transformed beam which is made of wood and the second moment of area I calculated earlier. This slope would result in minus 0.0082 radians. 
Going back to the stresses, we can find that the maximum stress at the bottom surface, which is made of wood, is equal to the maximum moment I found when drawing the bending moment diagram times the distance from the neutral axis to the bottom divided by the second moment of area. Notice that both the moment and the distance y are negative. This results in a negative and therefore compressive stress of 3.91 megapascals. This is of course not the maximum stress. At that same bottom location, we also have steel material. And since the strain in both materials is the same, but the steel is 16 times as resistant to deformation, it means that the stress is also 16 times that of the wood. The stress at the top of the beam, which is also made out of steel, also requires to use the ratio between elastic moduli. The moment is still minus 5.3, repeating, and the second moment of area has the same value. The only thing that changes here is the distance from the neutral axis to the top surface, and not only its value, but the fact that that distance is positive. With these values, we see that the maximum tensile stress occurs at the top surface and that the maximum compressive stress occurs at the bottom surface. Of course, the maximum stress in the wood would still be an important value as you would compare that to the ultimate tensile strength of the wood as opposed to the ultimate tensile strength of the steel, but more on that later. If you want to see other problems where we use singularity functions and transformed sections, make sure to check out the links in the description below. In the next video, we will look at the last of the four main types of stresses, the shearing stress due to transverse shear, so that later we can put all of them together using more circle and the principal stresses. Thanks for watching.